Welcome to the Adam Savage Project. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. And our special guest today is Mike Birbiglia. We're going to visit him in his virtual studio in Providence, Rhode Island. So, Adam, can I start by saying, first of all, thank you for having me on. Uh, second of all, we are in something that I think we would like to think that we'd be making Adam Savage proud <laughs> with what we have done to a straight ahead office. Cause this is, this is me moving to camera two, uh, oh. right here. And this is my bulletin board with all of my jokes. You see that's Boston toddlers and I'm in the, I'm the future. So like uh, Boston toddlers, for example, is like something very straightforward. Like, like, uh, I, I, the other day, my daughter is, is five. The other day, I, I said to her, mom's going to put you to bed tonight. And she said, she's not your mom. She's my mom. And I said, that's what my therapist keeps telling me. Because all toddlers have a Boston accent. They're like, I'm tired. And Boston toddlers are like, I'm wicked tired. But that's Boston toddlers right there. So, that, so this is the board of jokes, right? And then I go to camera one over here. These are all iPhones, by the way. And camera one is where I monologue. I tell stories, top of show. Uh, and then I walk to camera two, which I just showed you, which is this, uh, which is the joke board. I go to camera three, which is the slow round where I talk to virtual volunteers from around the world. On New Year's Eve, we're doing 4.30 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. to accommodate all of these European time zones and international time zones because we're, we're going to try and get volunteers um, from Berlin and Paris and, and really all over the world and try to do multiple countdowns internationally. Someone's knocking, someone's knocking at the door, <laughs> which, which actually has never happened before. Um, because, uh, because this is not a, this isn't a soundstage. It's just our office in Providence. We've had an office in our production company has had an office in Brooklyn where I live and Providence where my brother Joe lives for many, many years. And, uh, and now uh, we've, because this has more space and everything, we're here in this Providence office. So Adam, do you have any notes for our setup? I love your setup. I love that it's all on iPhones. That's actually, we're doing the same thing. Where is, um, my iPhone is somewhere. But basically- Oh, and our camera, four, our camera four is here. Our camera four is here. Nice. I, camera four curtain. is my favorite shot. That's my favorite Camera four shot. is insane. Camera four is a mad, a madness. <laughs> that makes me feel comfortable. I'm used to seeing all of that equipment. And we've been filming since March on my iPhone as well. I mean, the- I mean, I don't want to become an iPhone ad, but it's like the quality of the camera is almost like it's almost like what the hell's going on here. But and the microphone. It's also and as the a microphone. Host, yeah. There's only so much bandwidth you have. And on the first week, Norm set up a camera in the corner with like a microphone for me to wear and all this stuff to do. And I was like, no, I can't do any of that. Yes. Yeah. I need it to be really, really simple. Yeah, we do. Do you do you um, do you do multiple iPhones? Just just no, one just, for right now. If you do do multiple iPhones long term, we do a thing. We have a Black Magic switcher. So what Peter's doing right now is he's going just one, two, three, four, like the director of a talk show. That's we great. use the exact same one, the Black Magic ATEM Mini ISO Pro, I believe. Peter yes. Was not his head probably uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is that why you're is that why you're borrowing the production iphone on monday y yes and when we do oh, the live okay. streams that's what i'm using adam Love to, it. when i when i have my cobble of laptops and cables and dslr and clamps all of that is so we can do that fancy fade that, that mike just showed and oh we, we have the fancy fade by the way check this out oh. here we go <laughs> it's a <laughs> fancy <laughs> the fancy fade, the fade to black on the black magic switcher is a thing of beauty. <laughs> now we're, now we've become a black magic switcher ad. I love it. If I had notes, Mike, it would just be to maybe increase the distance from the desk to the back wall. So you get a little better depth of field. But besides that, yeah. I love no, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that that's something we can consider down the road. I mean, the fun, the funny thing, and I'm sure you deal with this a lot too, is like, 
is like it's also our office right <laughs> so like there has to be a functionality it's like there's c stands everywhere and 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 lights and you know all these things and it's like and then we have to show up to work and like ship you know books like this is not a joke like I'm signing like hundreds of copies of my book today. And I know you've dealt with this with your book before where you sign all these copies at once. You know, and it, it, there's, there's moments during it where I got tired and was like, ah, oh, do I have to do this? And I just kept on thinking of each person opening it up and seeing a signature and being like, oh. Yes. No, I it is you. like, there is something, there is something pleasant about like even like the, there's these this children's author named Grace Lynn, and she writes these beautiful children's books. And and my daughter that I read to my daughter, and and uh, it's signed. You know, she she signed it at Books Are Magic, and uh, in our neighborhood in Brooklyn, and and like there is something very special about a signed book from an author. It's true. It, it really is. Yeah. So can you talk? It seems like all of those cameras you have set up around the office are to replace what you can't have right now, which is an audience. Yep. yep. How good is your method at replacing an audience for you and giving you a feeling of feedback? So when we do, we do these shows, the virtual shows through Nowhere Comedy Club, which is, a, which is basically something, a company that started, I think like in June or so. And at first I was very skeptical of it. I'm sure you've had this over the years where you're kind of like, virtual comedy show on zoom like i don't it, i don't quite buy it and then and then a couple people tried it and said to me, comics tried it and said no no it's actually you know it's not bad and i said and and again this i feel like this is adam savage uh all over the place which is i was like well if i'm gonna do it i'm gonna hire a cinematographer to light the room and we're gonna you know, my director, Seth Barish, is going to choose the camera angles with me and all this stuff. And so, uh, and, and so, and so Matthew is our cinematographer and Seth Barish is our director. And we, and, 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 and Peter's producing with me and my brother, Joe. And, uh, and, and we just, I mean, we labor over it. We treat it like it's a TV show, even though it's not. And then what's interesting is there's, in the Zoom, there's 700 people simultaneously, but I can see them. Like, can you bring me to camera four, Peter? It's like, I can see them on a full screen here and oh, a full God. screen here. Tiny so in other words, if, so if I'm, yeah, so if I'm monologuing to one, right? Yeah. So I can see 40 people right here. Wow. And if I'm monologuing to two, I can see 40 people right here and 40 different people right there. So when I go back to, to three, it's like, it, it actually is the effect of, it's a type of being in the same room. It's not being in the same room, but it's right. a type of it. Well, it also so looks I'm like curious. even like oh, go within, ahead, the, within the 15, 20 feet, you're going between camera one, two, and three. That space, that breath that you get from that short walk gives a feeling of more space of, 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 of a space and also get, lets you pace and, and time differently. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's its own thing. I mean, like when I try to describe it to people, I go, it's a cross between interactive and a talk show and a stand-up comedy show. Like it's just, it's not a thing that exists. It's just this thing that's pandemic created. Um, which of course is, you know, Adam, what, you, what you've dealt with your whole career, which is like uh, facing a, a series of obstacles and then being like, how do we do this in a way that not only makes it as good as it would be, but maybe even better? Well, I'm curious because it changes all things about timing, doesn't it? You don't get an immediate feedback. It's delayed by a half second. So you're, are you, are you, I would, just, I mean, I'm not a stand-up comedian, but I imagine that when you get certain kinds of feedback, you can surf on that like a wave, yep. but the delay, that's not there. So does it change your whole kind of procedure? So the surfing of it all uh, is not there 
or or it is delayed. It is delayed. I surfing's not a great analogy for me because I'm terrible at surfing. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> so like, but but I but I have done stand up and I and I've I, I've lived the experience of um, well you know Seinfeld always said that I think his analogy was surfing and it was uh, I, in the interviews I've heard him say that the laugh. It's like, it's like this. It's like the laugh goes up and then when it starts to go down is when you go into the next setup. Right. It's just when it starts to go down is when you go into the next setup. And, and, and so, so yeah, so in that sense, that's, that's off the table. Um, however, yeah, there's a certain degree of confidence you have to have and that's where the production team comes in, Peter and Mabel and Joe and Seth and others, where we talk out the material in advance. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and so I feel like, you know what? This may not be like laugh pound for pound, the most laughs ever, but it is, we think it's very funny. Yeah. Hold on. Well, we, mean- have odd, we have an odd sound here. Can you, can you hear it? I'm curious if you can hear you that can sound. Okay. Get rid of it. Okay, as long as you can't hear it, let me know if you start to hear it. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I also imagine that you're excited about the challenge. Look, I've watched Thank God for Jokes, I think, three separate times. Oh, my gosh. And the thing I love about it is, it's, I think I've surmised that the whole structure of that show is also, like, the love of jokes is built into every level of that show. Agreed. <laughs> and and it's clear that you are a student that you like love the challenge of both the the complication of jokes and finding new ways to tell them and finding new avenues to figure them out so this is just another avenue isn't it not only that it's actually forced me to write more oh wow because it's the only thing you can do alone in a room without an audience right. and so and so so typically I'm harvesting to create like thank God for jokes or the new one or my girlfriend's boyfriend. It usually takes me uh, harvesting about five or six hours of stand-up comedy material and stories. And then right. it whittles down to a 90 minute show in this instance. Now, because we're all indoors, it's probably going to be more like eight or nine hours. Wow. Like just more because it's yeah. like, because what, because what am I going to fill my day with? I'm not going to go to the comedy cellar. I'm not going to go to go bananas in Cincinnati. Like I can't, I can't, no one can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, can we talk about the new book? Cause I read, a, yeah. I read a giant portion of it last night. Uh, I, I found all sorts of material in there. That's not in your beautiful Broadway show. It is such a beautiful book. It's a beautiful show. And I, I'm dying to talk about a technical aspect of the show. But can you talk about <laughs> how the book came to be? Uh, in, you know, you did the show on Broadway. You did the show on Netflix. Yeah. So, so it came out of uh, when I was the first year of my, of my daughter's life. Uh, I definitely had this sense of like... Um, this is really hard. <laughs> like, wow. Wow. They yeah. don't, they don't tell you about this, you know? And, and, and of course I, you know, my daughter's five and a half now. And so it's like literally like everything I do in my day with my daughter between playing soccer or collecting, you know, rocks or whatever it is, like is a ball, like literally <laughs> like it's just so much fun and we're so connected and it's so loving. Um, when they're, when they're, you know, that first year, if you don't connect in this really deep way, the way that my wife, Jen, connected, you do feel like, oh, no, like, what's going to happen? Like, I, is, am I ever going to connect? And, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, I, and, and, and Jen had been very clear that, like, she didn't want me to write about publicly and talk publicly about this experience because it was a shared experience with our family and we felt like it wasn't quite right. And, and, and so I just wrote privately in a journal and I wrote hundreds of pages, hundreds of pages of just like, what the hell is the, you know what I mean? Just like anger and frustration and all this stuff. And, and it's very cathartic, by the way, even if people are not writers, I always recommend journaling 
because it's such a great, it's very similar to cognitive therapy where you, you writing down something that you're frustrated about and you read it a week later and you go, oh, well, I was being a little silly there in hindsight. Yeah. That was not as big of a deal as I thought. And in some ways, this whole, sh this whole show and this book is like that. The book is like when I was writing that stuff, I always had this thought in my back, my back of my mind of like, I will use this someday somehow, whether it's for my own therapeutic experience or a show or whatever. And I think it was uh, 13 months in, we were at a film festival with my movie, Don't Think Twice. And, and, and they asked me to tell a story as part of a storytelling night. And, I, and it, the theme was jealousy. And I go, no thanks. <laughs> I said, no thanks. And my wife, Jen, goes, uh, well, you're jealous of our daughter, Una. You should talk about that. And I go, oh, I'll talk about that. You know, like if, you, <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if you're OK with me talking about it, I'll talk about that. And so then I, she and I sort of collaborated on a story that week. It was the first time I talked about it. And it really was this thing where like I started showing Jen more of my writing and she started showing me more of like her poetry that she had written. And over time, it became this thing where we we're like, okay, well, it's definitely a show. And so I read some of her poems in the show. And then at a certain point it was like, well, we have so much more. I mean, there's so many more stories uh, it really should be a book. It should be something. I mean, I, by the way, I know you're a Bay Area person. This is designed by some Bay, Bay Area friends. Wendy McNaughton and Crystal Saka designed the cover. It's so it's, beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, um, it really is like a piece of art uh, unto itself. It's a world of toys um, that, that when you open out the back, it's really, yeah, it's really pretty. So, so I, I'm, I'm one of these people great. who... Who believe, yeah, it feels nice. I'm one of these people who believes in sort of like the holding of the book and like you're, we were talking, the signing of the book and just the, the experience of it. And so, uh, yeah, and, and so in terms of that, it was, you know, Jen and I collaborating and that was, that was very involved. I mean, as you know, writing a book, I mean, you just, you go, oh, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah, it's awful. <laughs> and it's like, right, and writing a book with your wife is like going to therapy but there's no therapist. <laughs> well, and that's the thing about the book I find so rewarding is you talk so openly about the dark stuff that happens because it really does happen. And up until your book, I swear, I've been recommending to everyone with new kids to read Operating Instructions by Anne Lamott. Oh, cool. I don't know but that one, but I'll check it, it out. It, it's wonderful. It came out many years ago, like 20 years ago. Anne Lamott is a local writer amazing writer and she writes openly just about how dark it is like at three in the morning yeah. the baby's six months old and she's just like she has these terrible thoughts but all parents do and i really appreciate you writing down that complication and the fact that you wrote the book with jen is a testament to that you guys went all the way into that stuff and came back out of it yeah, and I think ultimately, like we're the we're we're the better for it because I think that airing that is better than sort of letting it form cancer in your body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> form, form into form into tumors because that's what it does, as you know. Well, yeah. I feel like a lot of parents. I'm I'm a new parent, relative new parent with a two year old, and so we watched the Netflix show right when our, our son was you know, one and a half or so. And so, you know, there are moments that we 100% identified with because we weren't journaling, right? We weren't, we were in survival yes. mode for the first six months. I feel like yes. the vast majority of parents, you forget what happened last week or two weeks ago, but the shared experience, I'm sure people do it on social media and do it on Facebook groups or whatever, but watching your show and reading your book brought back and it, it was like triggering in the right ways in all the, you know, the full spectrum of emotions, but it allowed us to talk about the things that we never talked about because we were in survival mode. But I think it's, I think what happens is in, in movies and TV and, and in books, I think so often what happens is uh, what happens in a lot with a lot of topics, which is the flattening of the topic. So in other words, like there's books where it's like, it's the most joy having children. The most joy. And then there's books that are like, it's horrible. <laughs> and, and, and what I wanted to do was, was, was really get accurate with how I felt and 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 get really nuanced with that so that i this the sort of the middle thing where you're where you're going i'm not sure 
You know, like sometimes I feel horrible. Sometimes I feel good. I don't know exactly how to feel about this. But it's wild, man, because when you, I, I didn't realize this until I wrote the new one, is that parenting, any book or show or anything about parenting, it, it's a third rail issue because people, apparently a lot of people are parents. <laughs> Like it's not a rare thing. And and with that, there's a lot of strong opinions about parenting. And a lot of the things that when people are critical of the book, I'm like, I think you're just being critical of me personally and like <laughs> my life choices and all this stuff. And it's like, it really does hurt your feelings. But then you go, well, it's, it's, like, it's not about me. It's about is about them and their experience with, with the book. And, and the way it comes out is like, you're a bad dad. And I'm, I have to be like, no, no, I know I'm a good dad. I'm just being honest with you about the journey from being a, a bad dad to being a good dad. And, and, and so like, I, you know, it's like any, it's weird. It's like any book or movie that has an epiphany you can point to the pre-epiphany and go, what a fucking jerk, you know? But it's like, <laughs> no, you gotta look at the post-epiphany guy. But but the internet is nothing but a uh, complete lack of context commentary. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, true. Um, I'm obsessed with this one technical detail of your Broadway show, which is the drop. Oh yeah. Um, I will you could even you could you you could even you can edit it in here if people want to <laughs> just see it, just so to know the context. We will totally do that. Um, I saw a picture of you on stage filled with toys, and then I started watching this special, and it was a blank stage, and I started thinking, how are the toys going to get out there? I know they're coming out. How are they getting out? And when they came out, I was like, yes! I was so happy. You know what's so funny about that is is it you know, so so how it happened was I was on tour with the material for a couple of years and yeah. and and what I found was the, the 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 when I would get to the part of the show and I would say and my you know and and the next morning my my daughter was born and you could feel in the room that they thought the show was over. And this is, you could just feel it. You thought that there was gonna be a lights cue. Like you could just feel in the room. They, they might as well have just been like, you know, just like literally walking out of the theater when I say our daughter is born. And I'm like, oh no, there's 25 minutes left in the show. There's a lot of journey that is crucial that needs to, to be done. And uh, so I actually, I called my director, Seth, and, and, my, and, and, my, and my producer, Ira Glass, and I was like, well, what are we going to do? Like, we got to do something to indicate that there's a lot more show. And, and, uh, and I said, uh, I, and Ira Glass said to me, on the, he goes, uh, you can just do, uh, and I said, I said, I, I suggested, my first suggestion was, what if we do some kind of radical light cue or radical uh, set change, just, just something big, you know, like, I don't know what it is. And Ira goes, well, it's, it's theater. You can do anything. Like it can literally just be toys and kids shit everywhere, you know? And I go, that's it, that's it, that's it. You know, like immediately on the phone, I was like, that's it. And then, uh, and, and I had just seen this play in New York called Yerma, which is a British play, um, very differently theme. I mean, very different tone, very serious play. But it was one of those things where you would have loved it because it was lights down, lights up, different set. Oh. You know, it was one of those ones where you just go, how on earth are they doing this? And, and in uh, theater, it's so immediate, it's almost, it's almost shocking, right? Like, because you're in the room with it, it's way more affecting than any other medium. Yes, I think that's 100% true because, yeah, there's no, there's no trickery that your brain can even imagine, basically. Yeah. And, 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 so, and, so, uh, and so I immediately thought of that, and I go, well, what if the toys just 
just appeared. What, what if they just appeared, you know? And so, we, so I, I mentioned this to Seth, and he goes, that's great. We brought it to our set, our set designer, Beowulf Barrett, and he goes, oh, well, you can rig that really easily. What you do is you put all the toys into these essentially bags in, in the fly space above the theater, uh, above, uh, you know, above the stage. And essentially it was like, how, how do, let's go to camera four and I'll just like explain this uh, to you up here. So it's like, so it's like, if this is the front of the stage, it's like bag of toys, bag of toys, bag of toys, bag of toys and this is all underneath me it's like six i'll go back to four but go back to three but it's like essentially six bags of toys all the way to the back and the beowulf right. did this really yeah beowulf did this really smart thing which is he had <laughs> the ones that are upstage farthest away from me are like the car seats and the ones exactly. that are like could kill you <laughs> Literally, like, if they hit you in the head, could kill you. So, so I go, you know, and then the next morning, my daughter was born, and, uh, and then it's like, phew, you know, and someone, and it's literally someone on Broadway, it's like someone on the side of the stage pulling a rope. Yeah. And all the bags go, and it's like, boom, and the audience, all, every night on Broadway, a thousand people go, And it was, it was so fun knowing that secret every night that that's what they were going to experience. There's a, a, a David Mamet quote. Uh, he says, you can, uh, you can easily blackmail an audience into a standing ovation. It is impossible to blackmail them into a gasp. Oh, I love that. I love that. Oh, my gosh. That, and the gasp on, yeah, the, on, the, on the Broadway show is totally intense. Like you can hear the, <gasps> the yeah, it's really lovely. One of the, one of the, one of the fun things about it is that, is that people have said, um, so many parents come to the show and they go, that's what my living room looks like. <laughs> no, it's exactly what all of our living rooms that's, look like. I have that thing. Okay. Oh my God, you picked up the I'm thing that we got. Ooh. I'm taking notes. Maybe we should buy that thing. <laughs> but I'm curious. Oh, that's really funny. You then wrote material that required you to find stuff in, in the pile. Did that, yes. did that frequently not work out for you? So classic sort of magic trick move, uh, triplicate of every item. Ah, uh, there we go. So there's like three poetry books. There's three magic sleep suits. There's three rain sticks. There's three whatever, baby boppy, whatever the heck thing. And uh, you know what's so funny? That's the number one question people ask when they come backstage at the Broadway show. They go, how do you know where this stuff is? I don't get it. And it's like, it's the, it is, it. you must find this in your profession all the time. Is like, sometimes it is, uh, uh, the simplest thing is the answer. Oh yeah. I have a, a lot of friends who are magicians and I, I'm not a magician, I'm magic adjacent, I guess. But uh, a friend of mine once explained that the best book ever written on magic is Mad Magazine's Book of Magic because the writers at Mad Magazine came up with the most outlandish solutions they could imagine. And about 70% of the time they got it right. <laughs> that's incredible that's an incredible story that's amazing that really is i mean yeah you know it's a great and i think it comes out any day if not this week like um did you ever see derek delgadio in and of itself oh my God. i saw it twice in la and also off broadway derek's a good friend and we just watched the documentary i saw it i saw i also saw it twice and i saw an advanced screening of the movie and direct, also directed by Frank Oz. Both of them yeah. are the stage in the, in the film. Have you seen the film yet? Yes. I have. Okay. <laughs> I was even more affected by the film than I was by the stage show. I couldn't believe it. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't yeah. know how they unpacked a better show in the film, but he, uh, Derek and Frank spent a year in the edit room for that. Yeah. It's, it's uncanny. I mean, if people are watching this and they're looking for something 
that makes you laugh and think and feel emotions in and of itself, I think is on Hulu or it's going to be on Hulu any day now. It is like, put it on your queue, whatever it is. Like, holy cow. Like, I honestly, like, I get choked up thinking about it now. Oh, no, 100%. I, I, also, actually, I think it intersects. Uh, the three of us have public personas. <laughs> sure. and, I, and a public person, I think the show speaks deeply to the side that we decide to show people and the side that we don't. And when you're in the business of being front public facing, all the psychological machinations that happen in there are, are, I think, augmented in some ways. And he speaks deeply to that. Yeah, yeah, because when you walk into the show and, and you see in the film that when people walk into the show, they choose, you know, uh, a card that, that dis describes who they are. It's like an optimist, you know, a magician, yeah. uh, you know, like, uh, like a rainmaker, uh, you know, a provider, a father, a son, you know, whatever the thing is. And I think that mine, and then I don't want to give away what happens, but like, I think mine was Optimist when I went. I went twice, but I think that was what it was. Yeah, the best recommendation I got before going to see the show was to be honest there, but I feel like the people who have public personas probably are more honest than the people who don't think about that stuff um, and just wanted a, a label. That's interesting. That's, so uh, I was thinking in the film, and again, I'm not going to do any spoilers. You get to see some people confront the I am that they chose, and it's yes. really intense. And it's really, it's, it's very intense. There, well, I yeah. guess the, the final magic trick in the show is a transformation that I don't think a magician has ever tried before, a kind of transformation. And the film perfectly illustrates that transformation. It really does. And like, I think. I, I said this to Derek, and I said it to Frank also, but I, 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 I said that there are things that they're doing on film, that they're capturing, that we as, as filmmakers of narrative film, and of course Frank is a narrative filmmaker also, but yeah. um, we're always trying to capture with performance, always. Yeah. But they're capturing it with the audience, in a, which is to say that like, it doesn't feel affected at all. Like people are having real experiences and, and it's on film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I asked Derek one of the difficulties of the show and he said one of the big difficulties was keeping cards in stock, the I am cards in stock because not everyone chooses them at the same periodicity. He's like, no one ever chose cobbler. <laughs> That's so <laughs> funny. Thousands of a, a cobbler. Problem. <laughs> That's like, everyone absurd. Chooses adventurer. <laughs> <laughs> that's ridiculous <laughs> so yeah so i'm so so i'm signing all these shipping them out because we do i think they're sold out for the christmas and new year's uh virtuals but we do book bundles with tickets to the virtual oh. show and then and then the other thing that i'm doing right now is uh, since ju it's two things one is when the pandemic started i did this virtual instagram live thing called tip your wait staff to raise money for comedy club restaurant wait staffs across the oh. country who, who were out of work. We, yeah. with tipyourweightstaff.com, we directed people to GoFundMes that raised about three quarters of a million dollars. So it was great. It felt, it felt great and it supported these small, uh, you know, the people, people at small clubs um, who, who are the, the, the restaurant workers. And then, and then that pivoted into this thing with my podcast, which is called Working It Out where we work out jokes in real time. Um, and so, you know, John Mulaney is the one I know you listened to that you mentioned yeah. on one of your other episodes here with Amber Ruffin. And uh, so we've had that and Ira Glass, and then, uh, you know, we've had Roy Wood Jr. And, and Rami Youssef. And it's just been, I have to say like, it's been a, a, similar to this. It's like, it's a great learning experience. Like the challenges of it, our challenges, but they also have been Ooh. satisfying. I'm about to, to run out of power. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> hey guys, Adam here to let you know that today's podcast is brought to you by my friends at American Giant. And just to be clear, 
They're my friends because I fell in love with their product a few years ago and talked about it as one of my favorite things at the end of one of the years on Tested, and they reached out and sent our crew some more of their incredible clothing. They truly make the greatest hoodie you have ever put on. I literally live for weeks in that thing. Don't worry, I wash it. And right now, you can get 15% off your first order when you use promo code ADAMS at American-Giant.com. That's 15% off when you use code ADAMS, A-D-A-M-S, at American-Giant.com. You missed when I said, this is an outrage. I will not stand for this. <laughs> I literally got the plug in the computer and the computer went boom. And I was like, yes. And then it went boom. Like Bugs Bunny, like uh, Wiley Coyote, who's my hero. But we, uh, but, but to, sorry to get back at the, the working it out. Yeah. It actually has the, the challenge of it has created a thing where I'm asking for advice. I'm running material that I never would have publicly even let people listen to the work in progress version of it right. from getting advice from David Sedaris and Hannah Gadsby and, and, and Hassan Minaj and Roy Wood Jr. and all these people who, you know, it's like, you could call them like they're people I know, but <laughs> would you call them? You know what I mean? No, totally. I, and I love that. I love that. I love hearing comedians work stuff out and also kind of work with, there's a little bit of a free zone between comedians when they're in a room together. Like, yeah. uh, 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 like I loved um, uh, the green room. Did you ever watch that show on Showtime? Um, Is it green room? Green room, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that has that vibe. Um, and I, 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 I found it really, yeah, I the creative process, listening to it happening, listening to you bounce these ideas off other comedians is thrilling. Because also you guys don't tend to laugh at each other either. You don't, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, 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 there's a lot of, yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've heard that it's the same in the Simpsons writing room. There's not a lot of actual laughing in a, in a comedy. Oh, writing. interesting. Yeah. No, that makes a ton of sense. I mean, I, I, I think that that's the mark of like when you can really get something going that you can tell is going to go the distance is when it's a group of comedians laughing. You go like, oh, I think we might be onto something here. Like I, I literally remember there's a story in my girlfriend's boyfriend where I talk about being in seventh grade on the scrambler ride. And it's like, it's just a circle inside of a circle, inside of a circle, inside of a circle. It, it was originally designed uh, by doctors called, it was called the shits or pantserator. And it was, you know, and it was, it's just this really silly bit about essentially me having a crush on this girl going on a ride and then throwing up on the ride. And I remember in my living room in, you know, 10, 15 years ago, pitching that idea to my director, Seth, and my brother, Joe, just from memory, you know, I hadn't written it, and them right. just laughing so hard. And like, we all knew at that moment, like, that's, that's in the show. Okay, so I have a I'm challenging you now, because you like to talk about your body being a lemon. <laughs> and I want to tell you, Having it's a chapter that, title. It's a chapter title. Just so that people know the context that I'm <laughs> you talk about your body being a lemon. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a chap my body is a lemon is a chapter title. Yeah. Well, I have seen that the the your the the bit on stage. I saw my girlfriend's boyfriend. Yeah. Oh right, and right, right. That combined with your impression of a piece of luggage running through the airport. Yeah. <laughs> Those are two I have of my wheels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never don't think of that when I'm dragging one of those two wheeled rollies. I'm always I picturing think, that I, it's I think two, I, I think that I think that being a physical comedian and being in shape are not mutually exclusive ideas. So totally like not. so like I think that I'm like you look perfect example Chris Farley. Chris Farley is one of the greatest physical comedians of all time. He also played football very seriously in high school, as I understand. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, uh, and was good, you know. And, uh, and, and uh, not that I'm any Chris Farley, who is, but I think, like, and he's one of the, I think, one of the funniest uh, 
physical comedians, I think it's not being in shape. It's, it's about understanding your, the body you have. <laughs> yes. No, I get that. I just was, I, you tend to talk about it being uncoordinated. And I'm just going to say that those are two of my favorite bits of physical comedy ever. That, make, that means the world to me. You know, it's that interesting thing about that, both of those bits, and, and this is sort of an interesting, if people are writers or, or performers, this is sort of an artist's journey uh, tidbit, which is those are both bits that I had thought of doing on stage 10 years earlier when I was okay. maybe 22, 23 years old. But early on in my career, I was just doing like one-liners and I, I, I didn't move on stage. I just had microphone stand and I would say my one-liners. And I couldn't conceive of the idea that this Mike Birbiglia persona on stage could ever act out what it looked like to be a roller suitcase. Right. <laughs> and, and at a certain point, I feel like what happened in my life where I was like, there's no such thing as the Mike Birbiglia persona. It's just whatever I do is that. And so I started to take more risks with that. And I'm, I feel like, I mean, even like the toys thing we're talking about is like that. I've never had a prop in a show like that. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've outdone Carrot Top now. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how uh, are, are you starting to think about standing on a stage sometime in late 21 or early 22? Are you, are you eagerly anticipating? I, I, did, I did safely distanced outdoor shows this summer. Ooh. Um, and in Connecticut and some places where numbers were really low and people wore masks and it was very, it was, you know, small crowds and, and small groups and that kind of thing. Uh, it was really fun. I mean, I think there is a way to do it safely. Um, certainly not this winter prop, you know, probably not this spring, but maybe in the summer or fall. Um, it's definitely made me, it's funny, I was talking on a podcast the other day with Jack Antonoff, who's a, who's a musician in Bleachers, and he contributed to the new Taylor Swift albums and everything, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a writer on those. And he was, saying, he was saying this interesting thing, which is the pandemic has made you realize which performers wanted to be performers and which ones were just mm -hmm. doing it because it was part of the job. Right. Be right. Because like, because he was like, I can't wait to get back. And I'm like, I can't wait to get back. And then some people are like, oh, this is nice. How I don't have to go out on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel the same way. I, I've done a lot of touring over the years and I, I can't wait to get to tell stories on stage again because it's just a different way to tell stories. Here's what I tell me. Tell me what you're the reason why you 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 crave it so much. I love knowing in person, I love sharing a story and finding out like, is that something you've experienced basically? Cause that's what the laughter and applause or awes or oohs mm -hmm. and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff is where you go, oh, that's not just something that I experience. Yeah, that there's an immediacy to the, to the interaction and reactivity, right? And there's halls that I like better than others because I can hear the audience better. Yeah. Like, yep. I don't know if you've ever played Austin City Limits indoors. Um, um, which, which venue? It's called Austin City Limits? It's called Austin City Limits. No, and, but I'll try it. I've always well, played the Paramount in Austin. No, the Austin City Limits. Uh, Chappelle's, two, Chappelle did a show there. And oh, you're of thinking of Stubbs? Are you thinking of Stubbs? No, no, no. It's called Austin City oh, okay. Limits. Okay. Okay. Um, and the, no member of the audience is more than about 75 feet from the stage because they're, oh. they're, they're stacked. And I've never been in a room that felt as immediate. And it just, at wow. that point, it feels almost like you're having a conversation with, with yes. a thousand people. There's a, you know, there's a, I couldn't recommend more a theater in Minneapolis called the Guthrie. They have a, uh, they have a- Oh, I don't know. They have a thrust stage. It's in a, it's in a theater complex uh, that has, I think, th three different theaters, but, for what for whatever reason, I think it's like no one. It's like a thousand seats, and it's like no one is more than I. I would say like fifty feet from the stage. Like it's so intimate, you oh. just can't even believe it. 
But it's also very hard to book. It's like everyone wants to get in there. Like it's a real marvel of our Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the hardest places I've played are uh, cut down arenas up in, up in Canada. Same. Where they'll take a hockey arena. And I, I, my wife will be in the audience telling me, oh, they loved it. And I'm like, I couldn't hear a thing. It sounded like I was playing to silence. That, that's like what it's sometimes I'll go on to a town that doesn't have a theater. And so they'll put me in like a civic center that's cut in half. And it's like, I just, it's hard to connect. It's hard to yeah. truly connect. Oh, actually I did play one really weird hall that was amazing, which was before Mythbusters. I, t I, I used to go out and do public speaking for industrial light and magic on the subject of special effects. And they sent me to, I know, they sent me to the Telluride Film Festival where I gave a talk on special effects at the police station. Oh, that's because, cool. Because the police station has this weird amphitheater-like lecture room that housed like 250 people. And it was an amazing night. I remember it feeling just like that, a very tiny, it felt like a much tiny room than it was. Speaking of which, and I think I have to wrap in a second because I, I have a I have a soccer I have a soccer appointment with my daughter. <laughs> football, football, <Come> <laughs> football, football. Uh, but uh, you were on the Amber Ruffin episode. You were asking for what she was listening to, watching, etc. Right now, and the thing that man, I just finished Watchmen on HBO, and yeah. that's one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. Yep. Um. I've now watched it all the way through three times because I love it so much. And it gets better I, with every successive viewing. So I posted about it on Instagram the other day. And the thing that you're saying is precisely what people have said to me, which is people have watched it three, four, five times. And they just say they, they learn more and more and more and more every time. It, I mean, it's, it's just an interesting testament to great. If, if you're telling a great story, it gets better with more viewing versus worse with more viewing. Like, thank God for jokes, which I've watched three times. <laughs> nice. <laughs> thank you, like, Adam. I, oh, and speaking of which, and, and using Norm's idea, um, I'm going to write, uh, this is for Adam, and we'll send this to you just so you'll oh, have to. Oh, lovely. Too. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the podcast in the middle of your busy book tour. <laughs> Love, Mike. Coming your way, Adam. I sent you're big truly one, California, truly Mike. one of the greats, and I feel so lucky to know you. Uh, uh, same right back at you, my friend. Have a wonderful day, and uh, hopefully we'll see each other before too long. <laughs>